the Scripture Study Project, our podcast that gives you a fresh and faithful study of the scriptures that will renew your excitement for your own personal study and help you passionately teach what you're learning to others. I'm Krista, and I am here with my chewing a verse husband, Zach. Is that a thing? Chewing a verse. <laughs> I am a verse. I'm not a verse to chewing. Just a verse to ice chomping. I don't ice chomp. You chomp. Okay. Anyone else out there ice chewers? I'm no. sorry. It's if a... you are, repent. This episode is all about ice chomping <laughs> and how you should do it. So we're going to open Aww. up the scriptures and teach you. And by the end of the episode, Crystal will be converted. That is one thing that we will not do is make the scriptures say what we want them to say. You, gotta you, let should, the give scriptures them, you should give speak them a sample of your ice chomping. Like you should take some ice That would be it. so horrible. Here, I've got a cup right here. <laughs> Here you go. Give it a give it a, give it a chomp. Nothing like drinking cold water with a little bit of ice in it. Uh huh. And then chomp, and then chomping the ice. We get along pretty good, except for when it comes to <laughs> ice chomping. Anyway, sorry, we were just having the discussion before this started, and I couldn't help but I don't even know what chewing a verse means. It just was the first thing that came to my I mind. I chewing on a verse. There are a couple <laughs> oh. of verses on this episode that I am chewing on. Very very funny. Um, hey, we are excited to be with you. We're excited for this episode. This is uh, Luke 2 and Matthew 2. The Come Follow Me lesson is called We Have Come to Worship Him. And we're excited to dive in. Before we do, um, we have uh, another tip that might help with your New Testament study, either individually or uh, as you're studying with a family. And it's one that I think... Um, to some might seem really common sense, and maybe you're already doing this. To others, you might be a little averse to it, and we might hope to convert <laughs> you to it. Uh, but it's a very simple uh, idea that will has the potential to change your study of the Bible, both New Testament and Old Testament. And that is to grab yourself another translation of the Bible. Now, we could spend a lesson going into detail on the history of the King James Version, which is wonderful and it's rich. The King James Version itself is beautiful. The English is beautiful. However, it's a, it's one of the older English it's translations. It's 400 years old. The translation is 400 years old. The, Hence the language. The scholarship that is behind it is 400 years old. The language is, of course, old English. But um, beautiful, like you said. Uh-huh. Um, Especially when you start comparing some of the newer versions, you really appreciate the King James Version. I was listening to an uh, episode on the, oh, I forget the podcast, but it was, was with Tom Wayment talking about uh, New Testament translations. And he mentioned that when he teaches at BYU, uh, he felt like when he was teaching New Testament courses, half of the time he had to teach them first about Old English grammar before he could then teach them about the New Testament. And that's just the nature of the King James translation of the Bible. It's very beautiful. In some verses, you just can't get better than what's in the King James. But it's not the only translation out there. And for many people, it's not the best translation out there, at least not best for their needs. Most of the Christian world uses, has moved to different translations that are a little bit more modern in their language. Um, you know, get rid of the these and the thous and replace them with pronouns we're more familiar with. And also represent more updated research into the Greek um, or into the different languages of the Bible that... Uh, that understand a better cultural understanding of what's going on. And so some of the verses are more accurately reflect what was going on in the times that it records. Um, so if you are having a difficult time with the King James translation, our advice would be to don't, don't be shy away from grabbing another translation. In fact, if you pay close attention to the footnotes in some of the most recent general conferences, you'll notice that some of the general authorities use other translations of the Bible. I, we found one with President Uchtdorf using the, I think it was the NRSV that he used. Well, and if you think about maybe some of you have served, served missions or speak other languages, you know, King James Version is an English trans mm -hmm. translation of the Bible. So it's kind of like that. Maybe you've experienced different translations of even the Book of Mormon or the Bible. Um, and you think, wow, this is kind of cool studying in a different language because mm -hmm. you can compare. And in a lot of ways, you get that side of a study with different versions of the English scriptures. Yeah. So some that we might recommend, one, the most popular Bible in America is the NIV, the New International Version. The language is modernized. Um, it's a little bit less wordy and a little bit less word for word translation. The King James, they try to translate the Greek words in the order they appeared, which is why some of the wording gets kind of confusing. 
The NIV is a little bit more down the line if they tried to understand what the idea was behind the language, behind the Greek, and then translate the idea into English. So the reading of it's a little bit easier. Now, there are some verses that as you read it, you might go, you know, that's not quite what I think it means, and that's fine. This is someone else's interpretation of, of a translation, and you're totally fine to say that's not quite what I think it means. But some translations, uh, some verses, you may have never understood before, and you open up the NIV and you go, oh my gosh, that totally makes sense. Another one that's really popular is the NRSV, or one that's very similar to it that I love is the ESV, the English Standard Version. Um, that one tries to translate word for word. Um, it's a little bit closer to the King James, but it's also more modernized English, and I, I just love the blend of the two. There are some, uh, they call them message Bibles or dynamic Bibles, that are really, really far on one side, where it's almost like you're reading a newspaper article or a magazine article, and some of those... I don't like as much, but some people find a lot of power in those too. So uh, play around with it a bit. There's some great resources to find other Bibles. You don't have to buy them. They're all online. They're for free. You can go to like Bible Hub is a great place uh, to get different translations of the Bible. We'll put some links in our show notes this week and also watch for a post on Instagram that'll show you some translations that we like, even some study Bibles that we really like um, that might serve you well as a resource. Another thing I've done is Zach mentioned online some of the resources. I will actually go and Google verses occasionally just to see what mm -hmm. they're like in other in uh, in the other translations, just to kind of compare. compare. It can make your study a little bit more interesting and fun. Especially if you're teaching children, sometimes we'll read to our children. We read the Old Testament we were trying last year. Uh, we scrapped trying to read it from the Old Testament or from the King James because it just didn't work, and we just went straight straight to the NIV and read it to them from that. So much better. The story was so much more understandable. Uh, a way better way to get that to younger children. So whatever works for you, but there are some ideas that might help you a little bit. Okay, um, we want to start this week in Matthew chapter 2 with something that I've become, I don't know, I get obsessed about things kind of easily, so it's not that new to say that I'm obsessed about this. Uh, but ever since I read this chapter before Christmas, um, I, I can't get it out of my head, this one scene. So... In Matthew chapter 2, if you remember the story, this is the wise men that come to Herod and tell him that they've seen the star and they're asking him, where is he that is king of the Jews? Herod consults with his scribes and his chief priests. They confirm to him that seeing a star is indeed one of the signs of the Messiah. And so he goes back to the wise men and says, go and find him. And when you do, bring me word so that I may worship him also. The wise men, of course, go. It takes them a couple of years to get there. We learn in verse 11 that when they get to Jesus, he's no longer a babe, but a young child, and they're visiting his house. So this is a couple of years down the road that they find Jesus. Um, but when they get there, they worship him and present him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, here's what I like about this. There are three kind of characterizations in this story. First, of, of course, is Herod. Then there's the chief priests and the scribes, and then there's the wise men. The wise men are obviously the good example, but I'm interested not just in them, but in the contrast between them and Herod and the chief priests and scribes. All three groups of people believe in a Messiah. They believe in a Christ. However, only one of the three groups worships him. And what's interesting to me is that contrast between belief and worship, because I would have thought before the study that belief or that worship meant belief, or at least something kind of like it. And yet that's uh, obviously not the point. The chief priests and the scribes believe in a Messiah. Herod obviously believes so much so that he's willing to do what he did and, and slaughter the children. Uh, but it's only the wise men that believe and worship. Um, so I looked up the word worship, and in the Greek, um, it's a really, really rich word. It's proskenuo. I'm sure I butchered the, the pronunciation. But what the word means is it's a description of a physical act of getting down on your knees and putting your hands and your forehead on the ground to signify to whoever it is that you're worshiping that you submit to his will, to his supremacy. You put your hands on the ground saying, essentially... I give you my hands. 
If you want me to do something different than I'm currently doing, I will take what you want and prioritize it over I want. I will give you my hands. I put my head on the ground. If you want me to think something different or learn something or know something that I don't yet learn or know, I submit my mind to you. I'm putting my whole body lower than you. I'm submitting myself to you. That's what worship means. It's not simply a profession of belief. It's the submission of oneself to a higher being. In this case, it's the submission to Jesus, the Son of God. And so what we want to talk about in this episode, if that's really what worship means, and if we are intent on worshiping the Savior, both in our personal lives and in our services, how do we do it better? How can we submit ourselves to God? And Matthew chapter 2 and Luke chapter 2 are filled with stories of individuals who come and worship the Savior. And what we want to do is pull from their stories ways that we can improve our own worship of Jesus. I think it appropriate to talk first about Mary. We talked about her last week. That was our study in Luke 1, her experiences. And here she is again, having her own experiences with everything that's happening around her. Mm -hmm. Um, And all of that, through all of that, we're going to, she'll be kind of intermingled in some of these other stories. But the phrases that I wanted to talk about first was the things that we hear about Mary. So in Luke 2, verse 19, it says, But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And then again in verse 51, it says, But this mother, but his mother, kept all these sayings in her heart. So we don't hear a lot about what she does, besides that here she has, you know, gives birth to Jesus and she's think, doing all of all of the work essentially to get him here. And she's pondering. We don't hear a lot from her. But here she is doing something most significant at this time. And she chooses to ponder them and to think. And for me, as we think about all that's been going on, I think we can really relate this to our own worship. And just that sometimes our worship is just that. Pondering maybe a spiritual experience we have. Maybe it's we're told often to write down those spiritual experiences that we have. And I think that's one of the reasons some of these people who come to worship are going to do, there's a variety of things, actions that their worship brings. Like you're saying, you Mm -hmm. know, they put their hands down. They, there's calls to actions with some of them. And I feel like Mary's really using these spiritual moments that she's having and pondering them in her heart so that she can have strength to do a very different calling for the Savior than anyone else has. Mm -hmm. She's his mother and she becomes, she isn't someone that we ever hear actually preaching. Am I right Right. on that? I just want to make sure that I, and her calling is very different than what some of these other witnesses have to offer. Yeah, which is a great model because while there are times in our life when we are called to perform or to to worship in a visible way or in a very active way, um, there are, I think, wonderful moments in our life when that worship looks like something that happens personally and privately and in our own lives. I've, we've been doing with our kids with this Come Follow Me, we, we have these little family binders that we've got and uh, they've had a lot of fun as they've kind of let our family study on their turn asking us to ponder a scripture block by drawing a picture of what we think that we're seeing. And it's it's actually been a really sweet little experience that reminds me a lot of Mary, of taking an experience we're reading about in the scriptures and just internalizing it and putting myself there and feeling what would this have been like and what do I think it looked like and what do I feel when I read it? Yeah. The interesting part, and you're I know you're going to talk about Simeon in a minute, but sandwiched in between those verses of her pondering in her heart is this um, what would you call it from Simeon? A uh, telling of what's going to happen. Oh, mm-hmm. where he says to Mary, "Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed." So, I think it's interesting to hear that she also hears this. This is kind of a foretelling of why she's going to need to ponder these special moments, because this is what's ahead for her. Is a lot of heartache as she watches the death of her son and many other things happened to him throughout his life. So I feel like that's an important lesson for us to learn from her. I like that. 
So then in contrast, probably some of the, the next people that we think of when we think of these people worshiping, the wise men, we have Mary, um, let's talk the shepherds. So of course we, I'm sure you have read or you know the story. Probably that recite the story. Probably the most recited part of this story is um, when the shepherds are out in the field and get told that the Savior is going to be born. Um, and their reaction to this, we read in verse 15. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph, and the babe lying in a manger. Now these shepherds are cool when we think about their story. These were were Jews, and many of these people were looking for something. They were expecting something to come, either a savior in the form of a political leader or um, someone that just to, to deliver them from their sicknesses and their hardships of life. And I assume that in this group of shepherds, a pretty humble bunch, mm -hmm. um, was a variety of those. Probably maybe they were wanting all of that. Mm -hmm. And so here they were the first to, to hear about this from an angel, um, and their reactions are, let us now go even unto Bethlehem. So they were going to go and see. They weren't going to, they weren't going to wait. And I love that it says in verse 16, and they came with haste. They came with haste. They hurried. They were ready to meet this person that they had been, had been waiting upon. Mm -hmm. I like that as we're thinking of our own worship and how often we will get promptings, maybe not through an angelic visitation, but promptings and ideas for things that we should do differently than we're doing, or sometimes things we should become or be different than who we are, and how important it is for us to act with haste and not delay those promptings and impressions. I think if there's one thing we hopefully learned from President Monson's ministry, it's that, that you never delay a prompting to do a good thing. Don't put it off, because that's the angel calling to you saying, Jesus is calling. You need to come see him. You need to come act. You need to come do something. Yeah, because I would love to know the arrangements that needed to be made before they made haste. Like, did mm. they have to get someone to come and watch the sheep for them? Did they all just leave? Did one of them stay? Yeah, yeah. But that idea that that was their their hope and their reaction, their way of showing their faith and their way of worshiping. I also love that the first people that Luke records that the angel came to in this chapter is these shepherds, these everyday, humble, average people. Uh, if you remember last week, we talked about Luke's focus and Matthew's focus as well to show that this is a Jesus, especially Luke showing this is a universal Jesus. He's, he's a savior to all mankind. And so it's very fitting that the first people he shows up to are these shepherds. Yeah. Um, the part of the story that I was fascinated with is I love the story that we read in Luke 2, but there's 52 verses in Luke 2, and we usually kind of end as if the shepherds are the last thing that happens, and it's not. Um, when Jesus is of age, Mary and Joseph take him to the temple, and there are two individuals that he meets in the temple, and I love their story. The first person they meet is Simeon, this priest who I, I love the, the verse that describes kind of his uh, position or where he's at. This is verse 25. Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. I love this picture in fact, I think there's even a Bible video still shot. Maybe we can put that on our Instagram of Simeon, this kind of aged priest waiting. And I love the word waiting for the Savior to come to him. Um, I love the idea that so often in the Gospels, the Savior initiates the contact. And here he's just a baby. But here's another, maybe the first example where Jesus is initiating the contact. He's coming to Simeon in a very similar way that he so often comes to us. However, I also like that Simeon has been waiting for this for a really long time. And in our lives, I think that's sometimes, maybe more often the case, where we are waiting for the consolation of Israel. 
And it takes faith and it takes endurance and it takes time. Um, but we may not always be the shepherds that get the angelic visit. We might be Simeon that's been waiting the temple for who knows how long for the Savior to come to him. Um, and so I love that first word, waiting. Then the next story, verse 36, there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Aser. She was of a great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity, and she was a widow of about four score and four years. And I've heard Bible authors debate on whether that means that she's actually 84 or whether that means it's 84 years from her divorce, that she's been a widow for 84 years. Whichever one it is, she's certainly old. Like Simeon, has been waiting in the temple with fasting and prayer night and day, says verse 37. And she hears of Jesus in the temple. And so verse 38, she, coming in that instant, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him unto all that look for redemption in Jerusalem. And so I love the waiting involved. I love the worship. Um, I was impressed with Simeon this week that here he is filling this important role in the temple. And yet when Jesus shows up, all of a sudden that eclipses everything else that has happened in his life and everything that will happen in his life. He says, uh, verse 29, Now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation which thou hast prepared before the face of the people to lighten the Gentiles and to and the glory of thy people Israel. And so I love that he's waiting. And as soon as Jesus comes, this eclipses everything that's happened in his life. He worships in this very powerful way. And then Anna's example that as soon as she as she's waiting and she worships, then she witnesses and she goes and spreads this word to everyone that she's heard. And so those three words have kind of captivated my attention, waiting, worshiping, and witnessing. And I think we could have a podcast episode, each one of those, and you out there listening could probably write your own experiences of when you've had to wait for the consolation of Israel, when you've had powerful experiences worshiping, and when you've had powerful experiences witnessing to others what you've worshiped and what you've experienced while waiting. I love those words. And as we think about those in each of these stories, like the shepherds, they were waiting they went to worship and then it says, you know, the, the verse I didn't read afterward in verse 17. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. Well, and this is one of those moments when I'm, I'm really kind of sad that we're on one side of a microphone and we don't have someone else on the other side. Because the question I would love to ask that I think would fill the room with testimony is... What experiences have you had waiting? What experiences have you had worshiping? And what experiences have you had witnessing? Um, I would love to hear from everybody um, when they have waited for the consolation of Israel, when they've waited for the Savior, when he's come to them, when he's touched them, when he's, when he's reached out to them in whatever way, um, how those experiences have translated to worship. When Jesus reaches out to us, whether it's the babe in Bethlehem or whether it's the adult Messiah, you read stories in the New Testament, and every time he reaches out to someone, he instigates change. They then want to give him their heart or their head or their hands or their whole self. I will now follow you. I'll now do what you tell me to do. And so when he reaches out to us, that's the natural response is we want to change and give him something out of, out of gratitude and out of love. And then we want to go and witness it to everyone else. We want to tell other people about this Jesus that we've met and the change that's happened in us and in our families and how much happier it makes us. And so I wish that we could ask that question and hear responses. But yeah. um, but just from my own experience, maybe that's why I'm so passionate about this because I come from a family where we waited for quite a while before we really started having meaningful experiences um, with the church formally, with scripture and and with God, at least I did. Um, and I now see how much our worship has transformed my our small family here and my my larger family, my extended family, and and how that makes me want to witness that God does love us and loves our families and reaches out and heals and helps us and and comforts us. To end today, we have we loved the talk called The Blessings of Worship from Bishop Davies from October 2016. Of course, we'll put it in our show notes. We're being good about doing that this time. Mm -hmm. But we wanted to play 
um, this clip for you and to just give you his thoughts, which we thought just summed up these stories perfectly. Latter-day Saints are exceptional when it comes to serving in church callings, but sometimes we may go about our work routinely as though we are merely performing a job. Sometimes our attendance at meetings and service in the kingdom may lack the holy element of worship, and without that we are missing an incomparable spiritual encounter with the infinite, one we are entitled to as children of a loving Heavenly Father. Far from being an accidental, happy occurrence, worship is essential and central to our spiritual life. It is something we should yearn for, seek out, and strive to experience. When we worship God, we approach Him with reverent love, humility, and adoration. We acknowledge and accept Him as our sovereign King, the Creator of the universe, our beloved and infinitely loving Father. We respect and revere Him. We submit ourselves to Him. We lift our hearts in mighty prayer, cherish His word, rejoice in His grace, and commit to follow Him with dedicated loyalty. Worshiping God is such an essential element in the life of a disciple of Jesus Christ that if we fail to receive Him in our hearts, we will seek for Him in vain in our councils, churches, and temples. True disciples are drawn to worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters, calling upon the name of the Lord day and night. I love the power that worshiping has, as Bishop Davies points out, to transform the seemingly mundane and routine in our lives, our meetings, our maybe our scripture study or our prayers, into incredible experiences practically that looks like someone in prayer not just talking to god or reciting a prayer to him or even just listening but actually committing in prayer to offer him hands eyes mind heart actions heart whatever i said heart twice um or in a meeting focusing on those things that we need to change about our actions or about our feelings or about our our thoughts um i love that when we come to the Savior and when we worship Him, that it can change us and change our spiritual life and maybe even our spiritual environment. Um, To close, I love this verse to end Luke 2 because I think Jesus, of course, is the ultimate example of what worship of the Father looks like. Um, One of the few verses we have about Jesus in his childhood says that he increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. I love that Jesus, even Jesus, progresses in his mortality and grows in wisdom and stature and favor with God and favor with man because he worships the Father in the very true sense of the word. He is willing to give God, his Father, everything, all of his actions, all of his thoughts, all of his heart, all of his soul, his body, his very spiritual essence. He gives to God, and God changes him into um, the resurrected, incredible Messiah that we worship and love. Thank you for studying along with us this week. We hope that your study on your own and in other groups or with your families is a wonderful experience. Hopefully this kickstarts you. There's so much more to study and so much more to learn about worship and how we can change our worship. Um, please, we want to keep growing this community. So spread our podcast to others if you think it will help them. And if you will connect with us, let us know the practical things you're doing in your home to worship better. Share your ideas with the rest of the listenership. Um, contact us on Instagram, email us, wherever you can get a hold of us. And we would love to put voice to your text, or if you want to give us your voice yourself and share with us an audio clip of experiences you're having in your family as you worship together, or individually as you study the New Testament, we would love to share those. We're all trying to grow closer to God through our study of the New Testament this year. So thank you so much for studying with us, and we will see you next episode.